Hey there, and welcome to the Build Me A Brewery podcast. My name is Chris Hayton, and this is part two of the beer packaging segment. In this episode, I meet up with Nick Becker from Convoy Kegs to talk about how they help breweries with rental and leasing options for their keg fleet management. Always having a love of beer, Nick was an investor of the famous Hearts Pub in the Sydney Rocks area, and then following other Hearts Pub owner Mark Feathers to start the Rocks Brewery now over in Alexandria. Nick then found himself working for Kegstar along with founder and multiple beer entrepreneur Adam Tripsmith. Following Kegstar's acquisition by Brambles in 2015, loyalty started to shift with having to adapt to an ever-changing corporate structure and culture and so Nick followed Adam along with other former Kegstar employees Patrick Hanrahan and Mark Iggins to start Convoy Kegs which is the new player in the Australian market for keg fleet management. In our chat, we discuss the inner workings of how keg rental and leasing works, plus advice around what is the sweet spot for when breweries should start considering this as an option. This is another great episode that explores another important consideration when it comes to beer packaging. So I hope you enjoy it then. My sit down with Nick Becker from Convoy Kegs. Uh, well, welcome Nick to the Bill Me Brewery podcast. Thanks for coming on, mate. Thanks for having me, Chris. Appreciate it. No, that's fine, mate. And like I was explaining in our introduction, today's topic is basically keg rental and and, and leasing to the brewing industry. And uh, this is forming part of our packaging segment. So having um, Chris Kelly on earlier about the mobile canning side. So really want to talk about the, the keg side of things. So, yeah. and, you know, it was a, a little bit muddy to me before coming into this sort of interview and Uh, how it all works. Um, After doing a bit of research, you know, it seems like another great topic to explore for people that are are looking at starting a brewery. Um, And we'll obviously get through to some of the sweet spots of where people should be using these kinds of services. But before we do go into all that, mate, love to hear a bit more about how you came into the brewing industry, because I know you've got a pretty good little career in in the brewing side um you've come from <laughs> yep. from all different walks of life and and yeah, how you came to be where you are now with convoy so if you want to take it from there mate that'd be great yeah sure probably been been around i think it was floated to me around beer in in uh, late 2008 2009 when i, I was actually uh, overseas skiing and uh, got approached by a friend and said i've just been made redundant i'm uh, i'm going to start a beer company so i was like right I, when i'm Finished traveling, I'll uh, mate, I'll have a crack at that with you. I'll come back. <laughs> Got a job in a pub just to uh, just to keep the travel bug rolling for a while and and help help sell beer and go around to to beer festivals and and whatnot. So um, that was part of the Rocks Brewing Company with with Mark Feathers in the day. That was about two thousand and eight, end of two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and then obviously we got involved in a pub in the Rocks called Hearts Pub, um, and it kind of kicked off from there. I left the other pub job, started. The, the job in, in Hearts Pub along with selling beer. I went from um, travelling around selling beer festival to beer festival. Back in the day, there was the Sydney bar shows and all those kind of things that were uh, were around that we don't really see see too much anymore or not in, not in the beer side of things because it's a beer festival almost every weekend. <laughs> so it started off with that. And back in those days, it was there, were, there weren't – It was this, we're going back 12 years ago now. It was like stone and wood were just, just appearing – Little creatures were probably the the crafty side, and they're not sure if they'd been sold just then, or they might have just been sold to line, or maybe not even yet. So it was it was back in the day. It was pretty young, so it was it was kind of good. And, and actually, being able to talk to some of those guys, like the Ross Durasiches from Stone and Wood, you know, to having to talk to them. One, they're trying to sell beer to our pub, and it was two, me picking their brains about how to sell beer to other pubs. So it was kind of a uh, a nice way to kick off um, what was my beer selling career back then. And that turned into um, to building a brewery. We after we had, I think we did had five different contract brewing facilities going, brewing beer for us at the time. So it was all around Sydney with uh, with Mark and Scotty Morgan at the time, brewing beer out of every facility. Some of the guys you've done with Dan Shaw out at the Australian down at the Illawarra Brewing Company, which was Five Islands back in the day, uh, and all over the place. I think Riverside did some beer for us with Dave Padden. I think it was all over the we we're all over the place, but it got to the point where we were producing too much that we needed to build a brewery. So we, um, yeah, built built what is now Rocks Brewing Company down in Alexandria, which was a bit of fun. And I turned into not I turned into the, the operations guy, moving beer around the country rather than selling it as much. So we put in a sales team, 
and I did a couple of years of that and then got to the point where it was uh it was time to to move on and try different things and, and, and work with different people and, and that's when I joined the supplier side of the industry and went to the dark side, so to speak. <laughs> and ended up with with Kegstar um after Sam Maitland, who was the sales guy, and I caught up, who used to be at McLaren Vale Beer, went back in sales rep days when we were caught up at pubs. Um so he was the sales guy at, at Kegstar at the time and dragged me into it. Um and that was that was kind of it for me on the supplier side. I really enjoyed Really enjoyed visiting other people's breweries and and giving advice on where I could help them grow. And it wasn't just a it was a relationship thing for me. It wasn't just kegs. Kegs were pretty easy, but relationships amongst the industry have been probably the 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 building blocks of why I really love this industry because all of the people here have supported and helped, and we've all grown together. And you can see where that's got to. A couple of years, what are you, three and a bit years at Kegstar and. A few of us uh, under the Brambles banner, and a few of us um, decided that once Adam Trip Smith, who who started Kegstar, once he left, it, it was starting to feel like the walls were caving in a bit, um, and, it, and it was getting tighter and tighter. So we had a crack at um, at starting something ourselves, and that's when Convoy kicked off, 2019, July 2019. So we're now about 18 months old, and uh, in a one player market, we've just created a second player, which is Kept everyone honest, really. Mm. So that's kind of my beer career. It went from uh, selling beer to, to managing and, and owning part of a pub um, into the supply side. Any uh, home brewing stories, uh, backyard brewing? No, I don't have a lot of home brewing stuff, to be honest. I, um, uh, I probably left that to the, to the professionals back in the day. I've, I've done a couple of, I've done a fair few brews in my time, but I, I did, a, did a little, my, probably my first one was at what is now. I think it's Four Pines now, but the Joel James Squire Brewery down at Darling Harbour. Okay, I yeah. did a little brew for the uh, for Fourth of July beer, actually, funnily enough. But um, that was probably my first actual mash in, dig out, do everything on a yep. little thousand liter kit. So, yep. so no home brewing, but I've done a f- quite a bit over the over the time. But um, but I probably like I grew up in Adelaide, so little creatures. Uh, sorry, Cooper's Cooper's Pale Ale. Back in the day, and then Southwark Pale Ale. Back when I first started drinking, were probably two beers that uh, stemmed where my beer taste buds were going. And then I think it wasn't until I moved to Sydney in two thousand and one, where James Squire's Amber Ale was just starting. Oh yeah! But when Little Creatures Bright Ale came out, that was uh, that was probably my epiphany beer. That you know what, this is there's more to uh, there's more to beer than than light lager. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what we were drinking back in the day. So yeah. that kind of pushed me down the route of trying different beers and moving towards, and that was early 2000s. So that probably then went to, you know, James Squire, Golden Ales, and then then Stone and Wood came out, Four Pines started appearing, a few of those other breweries came on. So while I haven't done a lot of brewing, I've kind of that's, – that's where my beer um, timeline kind of went towards yeah hoppier ales so to speak it's it's so. interesting to hear like because little creatures have come up quite a lot you know uh, about like they to me are of you know some of the trailblazers when it comes totally. to craft in, in australia in, in modern day yeah. but yeah it's like when you first tried um a little creatures it would have tasted really hoppy and mm. you know really different and and now with the beers that are available in, in the australian market for craft it's like well it's it's not nowhere near as hoppy as what's come what, what's coming yeah, out now. Totally. So, and if you drink a little, like I remember going to Perth a couple of years ago for the first time, and went down to to, to Fremantle and had a bright ale out of the brewery, and had been in beer for a while then. So it was like I'm not sure if the beers changed or if if my taste buds had moved on and changed, but it wasn't the fruity hoppiness that it used to. It might still might still well be, but um, it probably hasn't changed that much. But I think. Our palates have changed. Yeah, and absolutely. On. Still a good beer, but mm. it, it's it wasn't that bang in your mouth for like that. You, that after drinking a two is new, went to something that had hops in it with fruity yeah. fruity yeah. hops. Um, certainly put me on that, and then and then going down the stone and wood when stone and wood first came on oh, with those yeah. galaxy hops. Yeah, it was like oh, wow. I think, I think the first time I tried stone and wood was at the Dove and Olive actually. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. When they had on tap there, and well, they still do, but uh, yeah, blown away by. It. Like that it was just just a cracking beer, and and it still is. And even though they've gone through iterations of different size breweries and then moved their way up to a pretty big 
facility in Mwilumba there. Um, the beer's still bloody good. It's yeah. Still, still s- sticks to its traditions. Yeah. Sure. Well, talking about, you mentioned about our palettes have changed. And um, in the previous segment where I had in, in equipment sourcing side of things, I um, had Neil Playfoot, who's well known in the Asian and Chinese market for brewery right. consulting. And he's talking about that they're not quite at the same palette as what the Australian market is. Yeah. And which they were talking about different cultures and how different palettes like different types of beers. Yeah. Um, so in China, Hefeweizens are one of the best sellers. Yeah, right. The, the wheaty type beer. The original um, hazy. Yeah. So, uh, and, and they were saying that the Chinese market and, and Asian markets, they're just not ready for really heavily hot beers yet. Yeah, right. So, yeah, it's interesting how different markets are, yeah, are sort of different to, to um, the palates. But uh, like I was saying in the um, introduction and, and earlier that, you know, you've got a pretty good brewing background and, and you now made that jump over to, like you said, the dark side or the other side of the table where you're the, the supplier of in the keg business. Um, yeah. So Convoy is, is fairly new to the market still, 18 months, yeah, months. Um, cracking on. So yeah. And you've all come from that keg star background, foundation of, of, the, of the business Convoy. And you've already talked a bit about how you guys got started and been in operation, but Tell us a bit about the services you do offer, locations, um, you know, the types of clientele and take it from there. Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, beer is the focus and, and the, the craft beer side of things um, is, has predominantly been our customer base. But we do do beer, cider, wine, seltzer these days, um, cocktails, tonic, tonic water. We just had a com- customer sign up for doing tonic water. So it's, it's, it's spanning what? Draft products are on tap, right? So we're getting more and more experimental, and I think the more the, the hotel side of things are starting to loosen what the old contracts were with the line and the CUBs of the world, and starting to experiment with other things on tap. So that's exper- that's expanding our customer base and reach, yep. which is pretty good. But we're still heavily predominantly with beer, mm. um, and that's still heavily on a fifty liter keg. Fifty liter A type keg is what our predominant sales are. But we do offer a thirty liter slim A type keg as well, um, which is def- which is definitely helps for the for the wine side of things, the cocktail side of things, and the, and the any th- the other things on tap other than beer. Um, the smaller the smaller uh, vessel definitely helps, but it also helps for beer now that we have reduced the ax- the the tax excise um, on a thirty liter keg. Uh, it's definitely helping some of those brewers get into more. Um, uh, maybe smaller locations, small bars um, that, that don't go beer through beer as quickly, um, and also putting those higher ABV beers that are not the the fast movers, the slower movers, um, into a smaller vessel that just helps helps it helps the freshness basically. Mm. So, and the, especially for under counter beer systems or ambient systems that are around the place, moving through beer quickly um, is a, is a is a big thing for freshness. Yeah, and. Can you explain for the audience how keg rental works? Yeah, sure. Basically, came about. Um, it's a bit. I guess it's it's a bit like a. If we, for people that don't know, it's a bit like the your gas bottle swap and go at the service station, right? Yeah. When you you don't want to go and buy the the keg outright, somewhere between one hundred and one hundred and fifty bucks, depending on what it is, how you, uh, what size, what vessel, what um, valves on it, and where you get it from, and how many you how many you're ordering. So rather than rather than employing a hell of a lot of capital into buying a keg fleet, then we're kind of offering just a, a simple rental solution where we deliver the you order, we deliver on the day you need them, you clean and fill them, and then basically send them out to market, and then we do the collection so you forget about it. There's a fairly high attrition rate for for kegs. Somewhere between five and ten percent of kegs get lost every year. No yep. one can, no one can tell us exactly what it is, but. When you ask anyone in the industry, it's they throw their hands up in the air and say somewhere between five and ten percent. So f- to lose a, a depreciating asset at a fairly high rate for someone that's that's that, that's also capital intensive for a small brewery that you know wants to spend that money on sales guys and marketing on on branding and all that stuff, um, and you just want to set and forget. So what we offer is basically you order, we deliver. You send out to venues and we do the collection mm. and it becomes a simple process and you order when you need to. But it also means that the brewery can start small and scale up and we have this funny thing in Australia called the double peak, which is Christmas and summer compared to the, the Northern Hemisphere that yeah. has summer in the middle of the year. Yep. 
So we have this really high peak at Christmas where you need more kegs than you do in wintertime. Mm, so mm. for us, you can just scale it up. You can just order more and then order less in wintertime. So mm. you don't need to hold this keg fleet that you, you, know, you, might, you might need. I don't know, somewhere in the industry says that you need, for every full keg, you need five or six or seven empties. So it's a fairly capital intensive. Oh, yeah, I'm learning that. And right. I think a lot of people in the podcast. Stainless steel isn't cheap. <laughs> no. You know, and it's, no. it's only getting more expensive. Mm-hmm. At the moment, we've, with COVID, I think we had a, a bit of a, a lower, a bit of a price drop in stainless, but that's coming back pretty quickly. Um, but it's pretty capital intensive for the small brewery that wants to invest in equipment. Get your beer right first, get yep. everything right on that side of things, and you can stick it in a keg anytime you like. So mm. that's, mm. that's kind of what our offering was. And, it, and it's, it's definitely helping a lot of those smaller breweries mm. now and bigger breweries that have grown with us scale up and scale down when they need. Mm. You mentioned a couple reasons of why a brewery should yep. you know, engage a service like Convoy, you know, attrition rate with kegs going lost and all that. Yep. We were talking a bit on, offline about why should a, a brewery go through a service like Convoy keg rental rather than owning their own kegs. And um, are you able to go through in a, a bit more deeper answer into that? Yeah, sure. Yep. I think every brewery has started with the uh, – the idealistic thing that I want my my brand on a keg. I would say there's not many breweries out there that don't have some kegs of their own, which is perfect for for startup in your own. If if you're serving beer at your own venue, that brew pub style. It depends on where you want to go. I think if you if you set if you set your targets of of this is what I need to do to keep my brewery alive. This is how many kegs I need to sell. This is how many cases I need to sell. This is what I need to do. Set that parameter with the results in mind and then work back on right how many kegs do i need right and then look at what that costs mm. and if that means you're just selling kegs with your, within your own facility take into consideration that loss of attrition rate um the cost of freight getting them back to you from where they're coming from if you take all that because you're only selling them in your own place pretty good idea just to buy a few kegs and keep them rotating through right not losing them you can utilize them a lot uh, and, and it becomes pretty simple as soon as you start sending them out to other venues, the attrition rate goes up. Mm. So if you're sending them just to your own little local suburb that you're running around collecting your own yourself, you're probably pretty good. If you start sending them out to Sydney Metro or Newcastle or then interstate, all of a sudden it, it takes a lot, a lot longer to get your kegs back, therefore mm. you need more. But you're also you start losing them a lot more. Yeah. So that's yeah. where Convoy comes in. So a lot of there's a lot of breweries out here that that Let's take Batch, for example, in the inner west that they deliver their own kegs generally. So they keep this, this pool of kegs that they deliver to their local area and then they use Convoy or a rental system for everywhere else, anywhere in the state, anywhere um, regionally or, or that's outside their reach. Yeah, okay. So there's, there's, there's a few different scenarios around what's, um, what the best scenario is, but there's definitely a sweet spot between owning a, owning a certain number and then renting a certain number to send out and not lose. Yeah. So yeah. there's also the hassles when you're in the brewery of, of running two different fleets. How many do I fill into my own kegs? How many do I put into rentals? So that becomes a logistical bit of a logistical nightmare too. And a lot of those guys that have had kegs in the past, young Henrys, they ended up selling their kegs to Kegstar back in the day and have gone to a full rental model because they know that that was just an easier operational model for them. Mm. So. It depends. Stone and Wood run a really, really tight network around that Northern Rivers area, so they run their own kegs there. But in other states, they use a rental. Mm. There's a lot of different things for different different breweries, and it depends what your route to market is or what your end game is and how that looks. Mm. And I guess to use an, as an example, and we've had many consultants come on and, and brewery owners talk about what the sweet spot is for people opening a brewery these days, and it seems to be around that 500 litre type brew house, uh, brew pub type model. I mean, yeah. it seems to be a, a growing trend. It's, a, it's an easy way to enter the market, start out, access yeah. those higher margins um, in your tap room. Yeah. You know, I've got ambitions to open up a brew pub to begin with, but with plans that anticipating good growth, people, you know, the beer being received really well, maybe expanding that into some distribution um, yeah, sure. Of, of, of my beer. So what sort of advice would you give someone um, about you know, managing their kegs around that or, or the packaging yeah. side? Yeah. 
for starters, I've never seen a brewery. I've never seen a brewery go to a smaller brew house. Mm-hmm. So if you can afford to go bigger, mm-hmm. go bigger mm-hmm. because you'll always have growth. Yep. Even if it's within your own facility, in your own brew pub, in, in either you can you can afford if you can afford to go slightly bigger, do it. Yep. There's my advice to start with. Yep. I've never seen another brewery go, oh, that was too big, we should go down. Yeah, and I'm hearing the exact same. I think probably the Rocks guys were maybe the only ones. I don't know if that was the system that, that was big bigger. Enough. We yeah. put more tanks in, that was more tanks and more tanks. It was it's mm. then it's about going back to going back to your end game. What results do you need? What how much revenue do you need? To keep your business open, yep. right. What? How does that relate to how many kegs I need to sell versus how many cases I need to sell? Yes, you know. So start with the end game in mind of how much money do I need, yeah, and then work back on how many kegs do I need, how many cases do I need to sell per week, per month, whatever that is, and then decide on what system. You yeah, need that's to put good in. advice. Yeah. Right. Well, and and listen, I I probably have ambitions to go bigger than the five hundred, but you know, I, I'd like to think anywhere up to the twenty hex side of things, but. But what I'm hearing is that brew, brew pub model, 500 litre, anything below yep. that, I think Neil Cameron's saying is a commercial nightmare. Yep. So, but they're managing your kegs around that. How Totally. Yeah. If, you, and that I, I, if you're looking at a 500 litre kit that's, that's just for your own brew pub, then you can go down the, the leasing or owning model and you can, you can lease kegs for five bucks a month-ish mm. type thing for, yep. on, a, on, a, on a lease type model. And then at the end of it, there'll be a buyout, a bit like your car, right? Yep. So it ends up costing you more over the long term, but it frees up some cash flow up front. Yeah. Um, at Convoy, we offer a, a brew pub model. So the, you pay the full keg rental to go when it goes in. But then if you reuse it, then it's only an $8 re, reuse fee. So you might, you might sit on that keg empty in the back of the warehouse for, for a month and then refill it. And it's, it's only another eight, eight bucks to refill. And the technology on that, Automatically detects when it's been cleaned and filled, so it'll it'll automatically create a, a billing cycle, so to speak. So there's no manual interaction or human uh, interference that needs to happen around that. It just just does it. Mm. So there's different. There's a few different different ways of of skinning that, I guess. But if it's as I went back to earlier, if you've got a brew pub and you are literally only going to sell kegs in your brew pub, and you can cycle them, then yeah. It's, it's a good it's a it's a good thing just to to own a few. Yeah. Yep. And when you're looking at expanding as soon as you, as soon as you send them out, yep. you'll start losing them. Yeah, that and that makes sense, yeah, because yep. you know, you've got more control over it. it's just been sold in your brewery or a couple local pubs here and there, yeah. you know, why not run your own? If you're walking it back from your tap room to the back shed, then you're not going to lose it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yep. not going to get turned into a barbecue. It's not going to get yeah. <laughs> turned into a home brew kit yeah. from someone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the market for keg rental Talking about Kegstar being probably one of the other major players in in this space. Is there any others that sort of play in 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 the keg rental business? Not in really. Australia? No, no, not in the not in the pooling business as such um, or leasing. There's, I mean, you can you can get you can finance money anywhere, right? The cost of money is pretty cheap at the moment. You can finance through a few different places, but no one actually does keg leasing or keg pooling other than Kegstar and ourselves. Mm. No, we're the only two. We've got. Our office is obviously here where we're sitting, but we've got a guy on the road in Melbourne, Tom Adams, who is ex cryo malt, been around the been around the industry for a long time. We've got uh, a sales girl in Perth, Claire, who's just gone on maternity leave. So we've got people around the country that that look after their areas mm. and make sure there's someone on the ground visiting customers, making sure that everything's going right. Not that not, it's it's all about deliveries and logistics. The keg, it's a piece of stainless steel, right? A few things can go wrong with the valves and whatnot, but other than that, it's about making sure that customers get them on time, making sure they forecast on time, and making sure that we can deliver um, when they need it. Yeah. Okay. And what would you say? Uh, you might have mentioned earlier in the piece um, a bit about the differences between you and Kegstar and, and other services, but what? I mean, I guess an opportunity for you to create the whole <laughs> sales pitch. Um, what would you say is the the main difference between Keg star and convoy. Yeah, look, we offer the same. It's the same keg. It's the same. Everything about it is the same. What where we differ is probably just the pricing model yep. um, and some of the technology. Um, all of our kegs have got what we call our keg fox tracking beacon on them, and that's part of another service we can go into later. But 
essentially, we're a, a fixed price model. So you get what you pay for. Mm. You understand that at, at the moment, our, our, for a casual renter, our price is twenty three ninety five for a keg. So you can get that delivered um, to your brewery and you know exactly where your cost of goods are. Kegstar have a, have a, a cheaper um, issue fee and then they charge a daily rental fee until someone has to scan it to a venue and that stops the billing cycle. So while it sounds cheaper up front, there's all these add-on costs that you get hit with later on. So there's a, a regional fee. So if you scan it to a regional pub, you get charged another six bucks. If you get charged, if you, if, you, if you hold it for three months, you get charged another six bucks. If you lose it, you get charged another. So there's all these add-ons that you actually, at the end of the month, you're like, I actually don't know what cost me to get a keg. So that's when we started Convoy. There's a lot of good things about Kegstar. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to Kegstar bash, that's for sure. But we, we took what was good and what was bad and, and tried to remove some of the bad things by technology and creating this fixed price model, which is what we were listening to from the industry coming back going, we don't know our cost of goods. We have to go through this statement that looks like a telephone book. It's, it's, it's hard to exactly know what, we, what we're going on with. So we've just kind of removed a bit of that stuff and, and just made it simple. Mm. Uh, our philosophy when we came in was like, how do we make this much simpler for everyone? Yeah. That we don't have to scan. There's no daily rental fees, so they know their cost of goods. And that's it. It's simple. Mm. As, long as, as, long as, as long as you order in time, you'll get the kegs in time and you can send them out to market. And we, we know what your price is. Now we do we do some agreement agreement deals for for long term contracts and and um, uh, and guys that go exclusively with us um, and they get a discount and they get guaranteed supply. So we we offer some discounts back from there um, based on based on volume and, and and average length to or days to market so to speak. So that's that's the big difference. We're just we we're just a fixed we're a fixed cost. Our technology is is on the keg that allows us not to have scanning. And then we don't charge a lost fee or other fees associated with it. That's mm. it. It's, it. It is what it is. And you, and you mentioned about the, the tracking technology, uh, yeah. KegFox. Uh, that forms part of the Internet of Things. Is that how it's been described? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a um, it's a device. You can see it on the top of the keg there, that black little box on top of the keg. It's a device that basically searches for Wi-Fi signals around the country and then triangulates a couple of Wi-Fi signals onto a, a Google database and sends that message of the location back to back to our home base basically. Oh wow, well, yeah. So it's it's pretty it's a pretty cool. It's been around for a while the technology, but it hasn't been probably good enough to be on a moving object. They use them a lot on gas meters to read read and there's a lot of static objects. So it hasn't been used on a on a something that moves quite often as a keg. So it's We've we spent a fair bit of time in the early days going through what a keg does, and it's surprising how fast you you fill up a whiteboard when you actually determine what a keg does, what movements it does, why it tilts, why it goes upside down, how, what temperature it goes through, how much, how many chemicals it hits, how many times it drops down a cellar, what it bounces, what it does. You fill up a, a whiteboard pretty quickly on on why the technology should wake up when it needs to wake up, send a message when it needs to send. And then send a temperature when it needs to send. So that's a, that's part of the other offering of it. For convoy, we just want it to tell us where it is, so we don't lose them. But for the for the brewer, they get the benefits of cycling what their supply chain is doing, so they can see their kegs in live and see where they are, what they're doing, where they're at a venue, and at what temperature they're at. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So it's it's pretty cool the back end of that of what we can start offering. So that's all being built. There's a lot of the Right now we can do temperature and location. Now we're building through. Now we've had them on the kegs for a couple of months. And we're now building through what cycle times look like, how long the average brewer holds their kegs for before they sell them, how long they sit at a venue for, how long they sit at their warehouse for. Is the warehouse doing? Is the warehouse keeping them cold for a start? Are you are you getting what you pay for? Is the warehouse doing first in first out and then moving older stock first rather than sending out newer stock and old stock's not sitting there? There's a whole lot of things that the technology is actually going to provide brewers as a value add. Yeah, no, I I only looked at the tracking capability when when I was doing my research. I wasn't aware of. Yeah, that sounds like a, a massive added benefit yeah. to because I've I've heard a lot of people talk about um, you know beer quality, especially when it's being shipped around the country. Well, who's handling that for you, and and are they experienced and professional enough? And because there's nothing worse than one of your kegs going out to a pub 
and you know a customer having what they thought was their favorite beer and tasting stale and yeah. oxidized oxidized yep. and yeah I, I guess i i never really consider that and that would give uh brewers a lot more peace of mind yeah they can mm. through our portal they can drill into keg down to the individual keg level and actually go through when it got to the venue what temperature it sat at, at the venue mm. and then so they can actually delve into a lot more of the history of since they've had that keg since there's been beer in it like what's it actually gone through so it gives them a hell of a lot of power to come back to you know when they get if they get a probably good for product recalls if there's any issues with beer you can actually delve into and put in the batch code that's in that keg yeah put it in the system and, and it'll spark where kegs are from that batch so you can product recalls pretty easy individual keg issues can be pretty simple to search search the keg number where is it what's its history and then why is it is it an issue with the beer or is it just an individual mm. isolated issue there's a whole lot of things that they will be able to delve into yeah sure. yeah it definitely will will help with you know like if you are having quality issues in certain parts of the country and yep. people picking up the phone and complaining well you can look at all that data and say well you're not storing the kegs at the right temperature or yep. or you can get on the phone straight to them and say hey Make sure it's served yeah. at this temperature. And yeah. does it do? Um, well, probably not that sophisticated. Well, maybe you can prove me wrong. Carbonation levels and all that no, as well. It doesn't go into that because no? it's it. It, re it really just sits on top of the keg, um, and it's really about the signal. So once you're down mm. into it, once you're down into a cellar, it picks up know, the um, external stuff. Yeah. Picks up external temperature and, mm. and ambient temperature of where the keg's sitting. Mm. To to measure stuff inside the keg means you need to add add something in there, a probe or a so while we're always looking at opportunities to figure out the best and the next level at the moment, there's nothing that you can put inside a keg to determine at the moment um, the volume of the keg. There's there's some external measures around volumes, but nothing internal or anything like carbonation level. No, no none of that yet. No, no. Well, uh, I had um, PK from B30. Yes. Do you know those guys? Yeah, yep. he's a good um, guy. Yeah, so he came on and, and explained a bit about some of their software and, and I'm sure that their software, because there's more brew house, yeah, you know, sort of geared. So, um, but it's amazing how, like hearing about all the different technology that and, and equipment that's come out for the, the brewing industry and how it's helped with quality and how it, automation and you know because that that's what brewers always looking for trying to reduce brew times and and have more time to sell their beer and, and yeah. talk about beer you know i don't want to be doing these 14 15 hour days um maybe in the beginning i'll have to but <laughs> yeah. um but if there's a way that I, if, if it's in my budget i can sort of get more peace of mind the set and forget type yeah. path and yeah i'd love to explore all that totally we've, we've i've spent a bit of time talking to pk pre-covid when we were allowed to have uh, conventions and all sorts and the, and brewcon and we with the technology we'll do some integration with other companies for sure so mm. that and the the beauty of it is that we'll be able to integrate with through apis through into any sort of net suite or other other accounting softwares that that breweries run whether it's beer 30 or if it's net suite or if it's whatever it'll just be an api that will be able to get that data and and present it the way they want to mm. so it's not a, it's not all about how we want to present it, they might want it differently. So that's and that's part of outside of keg pooling. That's the next part of the business is to offer the the keg tracking, which is now which is called catch catch asset tracking, which is our business offset is to offer that as a tracking service for companies that do own their own kegs. So if you do have a keg fleet and you don't want to lose it, well then you can at least put a beacon on it and you can track it through the software that we've provided. Mm. Yeah. Completely unaware of all the capabilities, I purely just thought it was a tracking sort of capability, and that that sounds like a, a primary cell there. But I mean, yeah, all those added things, you know, it will put a brewer's mind at ease. Totally, that, mm. that, that, I think if you can move your kegs quicker, if you can move your beer quicker through your supply chain and have more utilization out of your keg, then and not lose it, then you're going to get better value out of that asset. Mm. Hundred percent. Perfect. Moving on to Industry insights. Um, so, always like to get uh, guests' point of view on how they see the brewing industry, where it's going, new things yeah. coming on the market, uh, and you being a guest from a different, you know, part of the brewing industry. We've had yeah. the brewers on. We've had people in finance and 
and accounting and equipment sourcing, consulting. So, you know, want to get more insights around packaging or, um, you know, just your general thoughts on, on, the, on the craft beer industry or, or, or beer industry in, in Australia. Yeah, totally. It's been a, uh, it's obviously been a funny, funny 12 months with COVID um, and how that's, I guess, adjusted and pivoted all those buzzwords that you like to use around, around making, making changes. And definitely, uh, we saw through COVID with with um, with kegs it, and pubs closed. We definitely went from going accelerating really well to actually doing zero for a couple of months, and then it started to pick back up, and it's dropped and changed. and And as different states have gone into lockdown, and and Melbourne going into lockdown, it's it's kind of gone up and down in waves for the last probably seven months. Um, so that's been an interesting process, but it's also there's not too many times where you start a business and then seven months later you get told to shut down, eight months later you get told to shut down. So we spent a fair bit of time reflecting on what the first six or seven or eight months looked like and making our own adjustments and pivoting ourselves. And even though we weren't getting kegs out the door for that couple of months, um, we definitely had some, some self-reflection on where we can go, where we can do better um, and what our offering looks like. So. It def- definitely gave us a chance to 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 breathe, relax, figure out exactly where we're going, and 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 re-enter the market now that we're it's now firing firing back up. So we're and we're we're pulling on customers left, right, and centre. So I think we did some did some good stuff there. Made made life like I said earlier, made it just more simple for people, more simple for brewers, more simple for their operations. And it's and and while <laughs> while we had a pretty tight summer on kegs, um, which is that double peak. I think we've definitely learned some some lessons around from COVID and and through making sure that you get forecasting right and get all those things right through that. As for the industry, I, there's definitely breweries out there that have done very well from through that COVID period, pivoting towards packaging. Yeah, um, definitely it helps that some of the the major retailers have have, have put their Probably some of their they've changed some of their rules. They've they're paying quicker and like the Dan Murphys of the world, the BWS, it's all those they've they really helped push that local. They reduced their payment terms. So they've they've really helped some of those local guys um, get their packaging out into more stores quicker. Yeah, well, wow, okay. Which has been which is amazing. It's great. Mm. Um, so a lot of the and everyone went to their own online store quickly and everyone saw heaps of cash coming in quickly. That's that's definitely petered off now. We're definitely seeing less and less. However, the bottle shops are still doing quite well. But we're still, the CBD is only 50% full at the moment in Melbourne and Sydney. So we're not back to peak here. The pubs in here are still, and, and there's still restrictions on four square metres and I think that reduces to two sometime in the next week or so. But we're still seeing less people in pubs because they're not allowed to be there. Mm. So will the, will the draft market come back? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And Will some of those breweries that have have kind of relied on the cans and the and the and the packaging need to come back a bit towards draft? Yeah, hundred percent. I absolutely, without doubt. Well, now that pubs and clubs will come back on, people will start will will buy less from the bottle shops, mm. back, and and they'll spend some of their dollars in in the in the bars and clubs and pubs. Yeah, so I think draft will come back at some point. I hope they still. I hope they still now that they've now that they're in those bottle shops. I hope that. Um, creates much more awareness for the general public to go and buy more craft yep. or independent or however you want to deem it. But I still think that, that the draft market is, is plenty available. Yeah, I, I definitely think people will start coming back to it. As like you said, the the cities open up and the pubs yeah. open up um, more. And but but I also do feel like people are looking towards just having beers at home as well. Still, like yep. so, it's. Yeah, it's it's hard to tell from which angles where it's going to take bites out of certain parts of the industry. You know what I mean? Whether it's going to be kegs or whether it's going to be packaging. But you know, I know for myself, I prefer a beer poured from a tap. Yep. So I think there's always going to be that element where people will miss rather than just cracking open a can and, and all that. Yeah, but totally. um, you know, I've also heard a lot of lot of thoughts around how home brewing's made a massive resurgence as well. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Mm. Doesn't and and the and the cost of I mean, beers, it's not the cheapest, when, especially when we're talking about, you know, a hell of a lot of hops going into beer. Hops, not the cheapest ingredient, but it's definitely, um, 
I think the draft market when you're out when you're out at a pub drinking, you're drinking with mates. You probably have three or four more than you would at home by yourself. Potentially, I don't mm. know. Depends. It's probably me coming into it. I've got two young kids too. So. Oh, don't worry, mate. You're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but definitely going out to the pub on Friday night, which I haven't been to the pub for a while because it, it, yeah, I probably had four or five or six or eight more than I probably would have at home with a mate. That's for sure. Yeah. So look, I think I think there's definitely and and then there's more brew pubs opening around the place. There's more locations to go to. There's more destination places, which is. I think it's amazing. There's, there's, I was just up at Six String the other day, but there's another couple of breweries that are popping up on the Central Coast. There's one at Lake Macquarie now. There's, you know, there's a few up in Newcastle, and all of a sudden, there's, there's they're popping up all over the place, which is for regional locations, even down south coast like Jarvis Bay and yep, yeah, Jarvis Bay, Jarvis and, Bay. and um, I know that uh, Neil Cameron's opened one He's up got there. One there. Towards Berry Way or somewhere. Yeah, there. yep. Yeah, yeah there's so quite a lot up. of. They're good popping little... up, and you can and you can pop through. Oh, I'm trying to think, Cupid's down the south coast. There's a, there's a whole lot yeah, wherever you go. King, isn't it? Um, not Flaming Galar. Flaming I think Galar. they're down at yeah, um, Huskisson, yeah, I think. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So there's, yep. wherever you go, those destination breweries are around the place. Which, I mean, they'll still need kegs because they want to put kegs into their local market, right? So there's still a draft market out there for sure. Hundred mm. percent. Yeah. And uh, any new and exciting equipment that you've seen that's sort of coming out on the market in regards to packaging? I think probably over the last couple of years, I think just just the introduction of smaller canning lines, the, the ability or the access that smaller brewers can get to what was once only a major brewery piece of equipment, like a centrifuge, like a, even small pasteurizers, like canning lines, all of that stuff that's come down into that micro level is just going to make craft beer or indie beer however you want to determine it is more accessible mm. and better quality because that's that's what's hindered some craft smaller breweries is shelf life isn't it because totally. that's what the big big boys have, have had over them um, not not just volume and and automation and efficiencies of getting the product out there and being the economies of scale being cheaper but pasteurization is where you can then start entering those international markets as yeah. well isn't it yeah, so definitely mm. I think all of that, all of that being accessible to smaller breweries, it's it's all capital, right? So you'll you'll mm. definitely need more cash, but you don't need millions. Now you just need hundreds of thousands, right? To 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 get a good proper quality setup to create quality beer. Mm. I think it's all really accessible. As for like Chris from um, East Coast, having ex- accessibility to have someone turn up at your doorstep with a with a canning line, how easy is that? Back than back in the day, we it just wasn't possible. You had no. to go and contract brew your beer somewhere else to put it in bottles if you didn't have a bottling line, or cans weren't even a thing when we were doing it. So to have to have that available, um, and 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 to to watch how they've grown, and I don't know how many canning lines they've got now, half a dozen. Mm. It's great business. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think in terms of other equipment, I haven't. That's that's they're the probably the ones that. Um, Jump off the shelf to me is that it's everything's becoming just a lot more accessible for for the smaller brewer. Yeah, yeah, we've gotten a, a couple of different guests' opinions on cans versus bottles. What's your opinion? Yeah, I think cans are here to stay for sure. There's there's still a place in the market for bottles around the, the restaurant market's definitely still still keen on bottles, but cans aren't going anywhere. Where do I sit in quality wise? I don't know. I think I've, I've heard a few different opinions, but cans seem to be they don't get any light. They, they try and the, the do these days is um, a hell of a lot better than what it used to be. Yeah. So I think I think cans in terms of quality. I like drinking out of a can. I have no issue with it. But, mm. I um, I never used to. I always went the bottle route over a, um, a can yeah. um, like five plus years ago. But yeah, and uh, some people have mentioned that you know we've been led down the path of by a glass company saying it tastes better out of a bottle or it's better out of a bottle but i think uh pat from willie the boatman said it sits in a keg um if it sits in a can it's almost you know same thing same thing yeah Yeah. no i I like cans and i think in, in what we deal with in terms of kegs freight is a massive component and the fact that you're shipping around lighter containers you can put more beer on a pallet per liter it's it's cheaper to get around and it's lighter it's it's more cost effective. I think cans are here to stay for sure. And it's, yeah. it's a pretty simple solution. Mm. The fact that you can get a blank can that you don't have to order 
think back when you originally needed to order cans, you had to order 100,000 or 50,000 units printed. Now that you can order blank cans with stickers and yeah, you know, yep. there's a hell of a lot more options. Once again, going down that, there's, there's just an easier accessibility for, for smaller players to get into a market mm. that's, that's available. Mm. I think that it's all becoming easier, which is perfect. Mm. Beer trends, where do you see, uh, you know, we've got the like, – Hazy, sours, <laughs> low alcohol, no alcohol, seltzers. Mm. Seltzers making a big push. Never even really yeah. heard of seltzers before I started doing this yeah. podcast. That's coming to be Seltzers is a uh, it's a bit of a beast, isn't it? And with White Claw in the States now coming over here and all the, the seltzers that are popping up around the place. Is it here? I don't I don't know if it's here to stay. But can it be deemed a beer? I guess it is technically a beer because it's made with those ingredients, right? Mm. And it's still taxed as a beer. Um, so uh, it's it's still a beer. What's oh, trends? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like there's I feel like there's a bit of a trend going back to um, craft lagers, right? Everyone, it's, yep. it, it's the hardest beer to make lager. You can find all the faults in it. Mm-hmm. You can't hide it in hops and and malt, and dark malts and specialties. So I think there's a there's a couple of good lagers out there that are starting to pop up. Um, I had um, two birds um, lager, two birds uh, lager a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, very nice. Yeah, right. Very nice. Um, I don't know if it's got a certain name to it, Blue Label, but I um, had it at a, at a local pub in, in Penrith. But, um, yeah, right. yeah and, and Dan from the Australian mentioned that their, you know, craft lagers is, you know, with more flavour, you know, still with that crisp sort of yeah. look and, and mouthfeel, but they I think, got some good Mexican lagers on on, on Yeah, tap. Mexican lagers, phenomenal. Yeah. Can't even remember what it's called now. It's a, uh, it's a Mexican name. Yeah, um, lagers or something. Say yeah, say it's lagers yeah. or something six, like six that. Six Brothers or something it's called yeah. out of that, after the Colossimo guys. But, mm-hmm. um, that, no, that's a cracking lager. I loved it. I, I, I agree. that I think, like, Akasha's um, trade wind lager that was just had a bit of hoppiness to it and was – they don't sell much. They don't sell much, but I think it's because everyone sees the lager name, and but that's the majority of the beer drank in Australia is a lager. So yeah, I think if we can get some good good lagers out there, I think there's um, there's definitely space for that. Yeah, forward. yeah, I, I I love my lagers, but you know I've grown to love the the flavors of craft beer as yeah. well. And yeah. I, I I had a Carlton Draft the other day just because that's what I grew up with, and I, that was my favorite beer growing yeah. up. But yeah. Now I had it the other day. Just thought, oh, you know what? I've got a whole heap of bolters in the fridge, and you know, bolters on the tap, stonewoods on the tap. But I'll have a Carlton draft, you know. And I just think, gosh, why did I ever go back? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it, it gets a bit like that sometimes. I yeah, well, sometimes you need rushes. To. Rushes are like, like I've had had. I don't know where it was, but it was at the pub, and there wasn't a lot of options. I was like, oh, I'll have a rushes. I was like, oh, this is all right. Mm. I can deal with this. Yeah, it was just had a little bit of that extra maltiness, or a little bit something different. Yeah, didn't have that. I don't know. There's that taste that from over pasteurising or something. I don't know what it is, but mm. um, yeah, that was alright. But I think, yeah, I think there's some uh, there's some good beers definitely out there. Uh, I always, I, I feel like I always go back to a pale ale or an XPA, whatever fits into that category of pale ale. Yeah, sessionable stuff. I grew up on mm. on pale ale, and I think if I determine like what the breweries like by their pale ale these days. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's uh, that's probably my go to. Mm. And now that uh, with a couple of young kids and, and driving everywhere, it's tough to have too many of those big. I don't get to try too many uh, IPAs and double IPAs. No, nah, no. I got my wife's into cider right now. She yeah. used to be a big beer drinker, um, but she sort of changes her palate from time to time. Wanted some um, cider, so we love the dry cider side yeah. of things, not the real sweet stuff. Got some uh, Willy Bone Dry Cider. Yeah, and Bone Dry is that. I didn't realise uh, it was seven point two percent. She goes. Because like, you know, <laughs> uh, just had a kid, so just in, in between feeding the kid and all that, and oh, so cool. like, oh, here's a, here's a cider, it's seven point two, one point nine standard drinks, my fucking hell. <laughs> Solid. So, they make some good cider down at Willie Smith. Have you yeah. been down there? No, it's cracking, no. cracking no. cidery. Yeah, yeah, good place. Yeah, it's good. probably yeah, a big gap in my learning ciders. Love the Strongbows over in the UK. Yeah. Another dry cider fan, but and, and the Magnus and the Bulmers, but. Yeah, can't say. I've never never homebrewed a cider either. No, so. I, I think it's harder. It's, it's, uh, Neil Cameron is probably the one to talk to again about mm. um, putting cider in kegs and making it stable. Yeah. I think it's the sugar and the yeast. Uh, I like to, have a, like to re-ferment every now and then, so it's, <laughs> it's about having a crack at that. Yeah, yeah. perfect. But, yeah. All right, well, uh, coming towards the end, mate, any yeah, closing yeah. thoughts and advice on the um, keg rental or packaging side? 
there's always there's always some things. But as I said earlier, I think if you're starting a brewery, and I think that's where we're leading to with this podcast, is if if you're looking to get into it, then start with start with your end goal in mind of how much do I need to sell to actually make it feasible to start a business, um, and then work back from there. And if that means kegs, and kegs sell volume quicker, so when you start a brewery. Selling fifty liters, you know, that's seven cases you got to sell, six and a half, seven cases for one keg. So to go out and, and sell that one keg can be easier. Mm. And as and then go back, pull that back into how many kegs I need, and then and figure out how much do I want to invest in the brewery? Do I want to invest in in kegs, or do I want to like, do I want to do some leasing? Do I want to where do where am I going to sell my beer? And then and then determine what. You know what the best route to market for you guys for you is is it is it delivering your own kegs is it how far do you what do you how do you value your own time you know there's a big thing I don't think anyone values their own time as much as they should mm. and what you could be doing in that time to promote your business rather than just delivering kegs mm. and collecting kegs and trying to find them and, and and all that time so I've I've been in that brewery side where I've we've owned my own keg fleet before keg rentals were a part of it I've been on the keg on the on the brewery side where I've rented kegs, it's I'm still finding, even though I've been out of the brewery side, I'm still seeing rock brewing kegs popping up in Tasmania in Perth <laughs> and that, that, that we mm. that wouldn't have, that are now tables and chairs. Oh and, right. <laughs> so you know, it's it's a it's hard unless you've got someone dedicated to doing it. Yeah. It's hard to chase. And I think you'll probably find most brewers will say that. And most brewers will say, no, I don't want to do it anymore because it's hard. Mm. It is actually hard to to locate and and make sure you're not spending more money on something that you're going to lose that depreciates. Mm. So there's definitely a, a place for when you when you're starting up, just to feel the market, feel what you want to do, and then and invest in some rental kegs or some leased kegs or however you want to go. But definitely look at that end game in in mind and and what your route to market's going to be. Are you going to go interstate? Are you going to go outside your local area? Are you going to use distributors? Are you going to sell it within your own pub? Mm. I think that will help you determine what what path you need to take. Whether you're serving tanks in your own facility or kegs, like you know, having to, you still need when there's only a hundred liters left out of your five hundred liter serving tank. What do you do with it? Yeah, right. How do you how do you spin it? Do you have to keg it off? Do you you know? So there's a few different ways to to go down, but um, the keg rental market has has definitely just made life simpler and made it easier route to market and 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 entry point for breweries. So I think that's where where we quite we do quite well. And I think with convoy, we've just we've kind of just made it simple. You know what your cost is, you know what it, it is, you just make it part of your cost of goods and part of your operational expenses. Yeah. And you can get out there and not have to worry about losing it or collecting it or do whatever. Mm. And then you get to gather some intel all along the way. So I think yeah. that's that's probably my advice in terms of the keg side of the business. Yeah, well, that's probably my biggest surrising takeaway is like the capabilities of that um, technology you have uh, with the keg fox, um, yeah, all the cool. data that you can collect from it. So, but no sound advice there, mate. And um, it's a it's another avenue that I didn't think of before going into this podcast project and and brewery um, planning project. So, I really appreciate you sharing uh, yeah. your time and thoughts on the packaging side. It's going to complement uh, the Chris Kelly um, yeah. uh, episode and. You know, seeing both sides of packaging, and but uh, if people want to learn more, mate, where do they sort of yeah, reach? Thanks. Uh, yeah, jump on the website convoykegs.com or or send us an email convoy at convoykegs.com, um, and one of the guys or myself will be back to you pretty quickly with some uh, with some options and, and have a chat through. I think, you know, apart from price, there's a whole lot of other things that we can offer in terms of advice, and we've all been around the brewing industry for a long time, mm. so it's pick our brains. We're here for a chat. Kegs are simple. We're here for the relationships and we're here for, for a long time. That's, that's, it's part of the industry we love. I think Adam would say the same thing, that he's got himself back into the industry because it's, um, it's a place we like, it's the people we like, mm. for sure. Perfect. Well, uh, everyone, that was Nick Becker from Convoy Kegs. Thanks for coming on the podcast, mate. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Build Me A Brewery podcast. That was part two and the final episode of the beer packaging segment. 
Our next segment, we move into marketing and beer media, where we talk about the strategies that breweries can look at using to build their brands and and get more exposure for their beers, plus all the different media outlets and platforms that breweries can tap into related to the beer industry. As always, if you are liking the podcast so far and find the content useful, please give us a follow and rating on whatever platform you're listening on. Also, follow us on all our social media handles as well as visiting our website, www.buildmeabrewery.com.au and much more complimentary content will be coming your way if you sign up to our mailing list. I'm Chris Hayton, your host, and this is the Build Me A Brewery podcast.